So um, welcome everybody. Uh, with uh, with us today, we have Impa and Nir uh, and Nir colleagues. Uh, as you will see, this is um, a material that uh, that is very uh, useful and relevant for both uh, DG. So we are really happy to to gather um, all of you. As uh, as you can see, we are going to present you the methodology for the uh, rapid assessment of uh, capacity development, which is a non-invasive uh, approach, and you will realize it pretty uh, pretty soon. Um, the RAC is, uh, is based on a thorough devaluation methodology that was done 10 years ago on behalf of uh, DigiDevco. And it shares back then, so we're talking really about uh, 10 years ago, uh, back then there were also other, um, other institutions and other donors that were also uh, developing this kind of, um, of uh, methodologies to actually assess capacity development. And the RAC actually uh, shares many of the concerns and the contents of these uh, methodologies. And we analyzed back then uh, the work that was being done by, by the UNDP also by the uh, World Bank Institute and also by ECDPM uh, that most of you know, an European uh, think tank. And it's work on the five uh, Cs, the five uh, capabilities that uh, as you will see um, later on, we have actually um, uh, also gathered and, and it's also part of the framework of the, of the RAC. This methodology was uh, tested in three countries. It was tested in Bolivia, in Ukraine and in Chad. And actually the test performed in Bolivia was the one that mostly shaped the final methodology of the, of the rack. And so uh, today we have here, first of all, Enzo Caputo. He was the team leader of this uh, thorough devaluation uh, methodology that was done uh, for, uh, on behalf of DigiDevco. We also have uh, with us a colleague, uh, Paco, so Francisco Garcia. And back then he was the head of cooperation in, uh, in Bolivia. And he will be sharing with us the experience that Bolivia stakeholders, both at the delegation level, but also mostly at the national uh, counterparts level, actually uh, had um, when, uh, when we develop and we, when we tested back then the uh, the rack and then myself i was also part of the uh, of the evaluation team that that conceived this uh, thorough devaluation methodology 10, uh, 10 years ago and I, I was the team leader of the bolivia uh, rack test um what is the purpose of uh, today's webinar? So as I was saying before, we are going to present to you the, uh, the RAC uh, methodology, mainly the reasons behind. So why this methodology was, um, was defined, uh, what is its value added, not only for, uh, for us as uh, commission uh, staff, but also for, uh, for the main uh, stakeholders. And we are also going to present to you uh, its methodology because one of the main goals that um, uh, colleagues had 10 years ago when they uh, required us to, uh, to define this methodology it was actually for colleagues in delegations and also in, uh, in uh, headquarters unit to actually undertake themselves a RAC. Of course, maybe at the beginning with the support of, of a national uh, consultant and maybe with the support of international consultants, but really the main goal was always for us, so for officials, for, uh, for staff, let's say, in headquarters and delegations to actually perform ourselves the, the RAC. And so you will see in the PowerPoint that we are going to use uh, today is actually, it was actually done 10 years ago and it was done with this pedagogical approach, if you want, so that each of you at your own pace can actually undertake a RAC. So this is for us. A key, um, a key element also of the of the presentation today. The presentation is divided in three parts. The first one uh, on the reasoning behind in the uh, of the rack and the added value. In the second part, we are going to present you the four steps. And uh, then in the last uh, part, the third part, we are going to present you on the how to do uh, part. So how to undertake each of the uh, of the four steps. And we have foreseen at the end of uh, each uh, part actually a QA and uh, a session. Okay. And now I give the floor to, uh, to Enzo. Thank you, Marie Carmen. Well, uh, capacity development being a strategic objective of the EU external action, uh, we should respond to uh, two very simple questions, uh, at least in terms of formulation of the question. Then the way we respond is a bit more complicated. When uh, carrying out a development intervention, uh, an intervention uh, a support intervention uh, in the framework of a partnership with the country, we should ask ourselves if the people that were involved in this intervention have acquired new capacities. They are evolved uh, during the implementation of the intervention and thanks to the implementation of the intervention. The second question is if the institutions have gained in terms of uh, independence, initiative, resilience, 
so as they will be able after the intervention to continue and to uh, add more new uh, initiatives, successful initiatives. So uh, why to respond to these questions, we need a specific tool. Actually, because uh, the normal evaluations and, uh, and the monitoring as well, focus on intervention results. And intervention results may be referred to as the visible part of a process of uh, growth and development. Whilst the capacities of the individuals and institutions that are responsible for that action are rather the invisible part of this uh, uh, iceberg that helps us to understand what we mean. So uh, evaluations focus on the results of the intervention, RAC focuses on the capacity that supports the intervention. So it's a complementary tool to, uh, it's complementary to the evaluation, it's complementary to the monitoring. It is as uh, uh, during a long car trip, we needed to stop and check if the mechanical parts of our car are working well, if there is oil, if there is water. So we uh, check if the engine is working well, what it needs to work better, and then to give us a feedback on the fact, on the possibility that we reach the destination, the final destination. So that's why we integrated the, the original, the basic uh, intervention logic of an intervention that goes from inputs to outcomes to, to simplify, of course, the process. We integrated it with another intervention logic, which is the, the, the logic that produces the capacities to implement that intervention. Both of these intervention logics, they say, are as origin, the context and the quality of action for, for, from which the, the, the process depends. What we, do we intend as the capacity output and capacity out, outcomes? Of course, capacity and capacity development are defined by the OECD, and you can find it a remind of these definitions. For capacity output, we intend the uh, competences and skills of both the individuals and the institutions. An individual may learn how to set up a monitoring system. An institution may establish this monitoring system and make it working. But for capacity outcomes, we mean uh, the capacities of both individual and institutions to proceed alone, not only on this, uh, on the specific tasks of a defined intervention, but on their specific path to, which may be a professional path or may be a path, an institutional path of uh, independence, uh, initiative, capacities to carry out any kind of intervention from uh, the point of view of the institution. So, which is the RAC value added for the individual and or institution, institutional stakeholders? Well, first of all, uh, there is a, an addition of participation and motivation in the process of the intervention, because for the individuals, they feel themselves beneficiaries of the intervention, not only actors that are asked to uh, implement several steps, but they are beneficiaries in terms of, because we ask them uh, to what extent did they grow in terms of professionality. And on the institutional side, the, institutional, the institutions are put at the center of the intervention thus improving uh, their commitment, uh, possibly, and in involving not only those who are in charge of the intervention, but also the uh, entire institutional hierarchy 
because uh, there is an interest in the institution capacity growth. On the other side, it improves the intervention itself because uh, it provides an immediate feedback if there are bottlenecks at the level of capacities. And so uh, to uh, integrate the ongoing intervention with the specific uh, complementary actions. And on the other side, it, is, it may be done at micro and macro level, uh, which means that uh, it may uh, involve the RAC, either the single institution which is involved or the, uh, a wider institutional setup, which includes the institution involved. Thank you. Thank you. And what is the added value for, uh, for us in headquarters and also in the delegation? Oh, the first one is that it actually allows us identifying capacity development outputs and outcomes that were not uh, anticipated nor intended. And on this, I think that uh, it rings a bell to most of you. Uh, uh, I mean, as you know, most, our, most of our interventions uh, very rarely actually tend to precise to define a capacity development strategy. When we refer to capacity development, we tend to uh, have uh, more uh, broader statements or just to refer in a very, uh, very general way. So this, uh, this methodology uh, allows actually for identifying things that we didn't even um, envisage when we were uh, designing our our interventions. It also helps, of course, to improve the design and management of, of the interventions through a stronger consideration of these capacity development processes uh, involved. So because of this visualization or uh, highlighting of this uh, uh, unintended or unexpected uh, capacity development uh, um, um, results, we actually uh, we are uh, we are actually able to even uh, uh, improve our uh, the quality of our interventions. Then a key value added for us is, of course, the, the limited resources. And on this, we Will, uh, I will show you also in the next slide uh, with more details. But also, again, as it was the case for national stakeholders, uh, the added value for us is that it really it gives us an immediate uh, feedback and, and information. So um, compared to the usual uh, evaluation standards in which we need to, to wait uh, for some uh, months to receive uh, an evaluation report, in the uh, with the RAC, we are actually able to grasp the, the major achievements of the interaction uh, promoted by the interaction with an intervention at individual and organizational level in a rather fast uh, fast way. Then it can be done, the RAC can be done either alone or in combination with other performance measurement tools such as uh, the ROMs or also evaluation and the RAC can actually even be embedded in, uh, in one of these uh, performance tools in a ROM uh, or also in an, uh, in an evaluation. Another uh, added value for us is that it can be applied to different uh, ed modalities. And in fact, uh, uh, the RAC, uh, when we test it, we test it already in three uh, different typologies. We test it in the framework of a bias support uh, intervention. And this was the case in, um, in Bolivia, actually. And then we also test it in the, in the case of a sector approach and also in the case of a standard uh, program. So uh, the RAC can be done in up to two months. And we have, when, uh, when we were hired by DEFCO 10 years ago to develop the methodology, we, are, we already, uh, we also uh, develop uh, a standard TOR. So this is available uh, to you. Of course, we need to adapt it based on your desired application. But uh, I mean, this is already something that exists. And you will, uh, you will receive the link to uh, download it. And you can have either a standard uh, RAC. And uh, as you can see on the screen, it doesn't actually require much in terms of um, of uh, expertise, international and national expertise, but uh, the RAC that actually we are going to um, to present to you here, and which is actually the recommended uh, option if you actually uh, decide to undertake a RAC, is the one that actually includes uh, coaching. And so maybe for this, if you uh, really want to uh, jump in and uh, and do some RACs, maybe for the first one, we uh, the recommendation will be that you actually request the support of an international expert, uh, maybe with a profile on evaluation, also some facilitation. Uh, uh, skills, but I mean, this would be our recommendation anyway that uh, if you want to undertake a, a RAC so that for the first one, maybe you, you hire an external consultant. But anyway, our key recommendation is that you undertake a RAC and you will see the added value of that and that you actually include the, the coaching. And as I was saying before, the main goal be, behind all of this uh, request of 10 years ago, but the same uh, goal uh, remains uh, as of today, is that we will want you uh, to actually undertake your, uh, your own uh, RAC with, uh, with time. And also, as you can, um, as you will see, normally in the standard evaluations, I mean, 
because you could also, of, of course, I mean, as I said at the beginning, we actually develop uh, this uh, thorough devaluation methodology for capacity um, uh, development. But as we know, this kind of, um, uh, of evaluation actually uh, requires significant administrative bar burden, uh, both for the donors, but also for the national institutions in which, I mean, you will actually need to uh, do an in-depth investigation of their internal processes. And sometimes, well, I mean, national stakeholders, they are not very happy to receive uh, this, this kind of, of evaluation. So having a rack actually, if you want, uh, break even a little bit, even the dichotomy in this uh, in the standard evaluation. So the dichotomy between the evaluator and the evaluated person here in the rack, as you will see, since this is mostly uh, an exchange and a dialogue tool, uh, they don't feel, uh, they feel much more at ease. So um, this is also one key uh, added, uh, added value on the rack. And then, of course, the last one that we identified is that you can uh, do it ex ante uh, to identify new interventions. You can do it during an intervention, so to adjust uh, potential um, issues. And then you can also do it uh, ex post, so at the end of an intervention, and also to establish um, a baseline on uh, baseline sorry on, on capacities. So these are uh, for us what would be the main added values. So this is in theory, even if we have some uh, some of them already in practice. And now we give the floor to Paco, and he will share with us the, the experience in, um, in Bolivia. Over to you, Paco. So thank you, Mari Carmen, and hello, Enzo. Uh, hello. Nice to see you again after a few years. For those who don't know Enzo, yeah. uh, when, when he came to Bolivia, he was actually an institution in itself in the, in the, in the world of capacity building, PFM, and all kind of missions. So yeah. nice, nice to talk to you again. So listen, um, my presentation, I don't have a PowerPoint good for you. Um, it was just to tell you how it went for the delegation. For those of you who are in delegation, you know how this works. One day you receive a phone call or an email from your desk and say, listen, Paco, DEFCO is developing a new tool to assess capacity building programs. And uh, they're looking for pilot contracts, pilot countries, and Jolita thinks that uh, she wants to have one in Latin America and she thinks that Bolivia would be a good example because you have seven budget support programs. And then you say, yeah, super, this is what we need for June. But since she had mentioned the magic word Jolita and my promotion was going around, I decided to accept and, and embrace it. So, um, we had to choose one of, of our capacity building programs. And then a bit of background, um, that was in 2011 or 12, something like that. And um, um, for those of you not familiar with Latin America, in Bolivia, uh, Evo Morales had become president in 2005. Evo Morales was actually the, the president of the trade union of cocaleros, of the peasants that are planting coca leaves before becoming president. And he became famous because of fighting the army and the Americans in the fight against drugs that until until 2005 was led by, by the Americans like in many countries. So the American approach was a zero coca approach and then planting coca was forbidden uh, and it was a crime. So they would go there with police, with arms. There were many casualties, dead people every year, uh, lots of people in jail for planting coca. Uh, and then Evo Morales came to power, won the elections. And uh, first thing he did as the president of the Cocaleros was to change the policy on, on coca leaves and, and not on drugs. For him, this is coca is one thing, cocaine is another thing and uh, we should not pay uh, with our coca, which is as a sacred leaf and comes from, from the Aymaras and the indigenous populations. And we use it for, for as a medicine, we use it for talking to our gods in the indigenous, for rituals and, and, there, and, and for chewing. And in, in Bolivia, they chew coca leaves as, as we take off it. So he kicked out the American ambassador, he kicked out the DEA, DEA from, from Bolivia, and he asked the European Union for international help for a new drugs, not drugs, uh, coca alternative development policy. And he said, coca plantation, 
first of all, we need some coca and, and the coca that we are planting in excess is a, is a problem of poverty. It's not a problem of, of crime. And, and, and it is you in the West who invented uh, a way to prostitute our sacred leaf and turn it into something bad for health. So that was the policy. We started to support uh, that, that policy in Bolivia in 2006. And at the beginning, of course, there was no institution there. There was no policy. There was no nothing. So we started with a project. And with that project, we were supporting the government. And we were creating uh, a very, very weak uh, institutional capacity and a policy uh, of alternative development, they call it integral development there, uh, that we could with a view that we could that we could support that in the future with a body support program. So we were like three, four years in a project approach. And then we move when when we had a minimum of institutionality and a, and a minimum of policy, we move to budget support. Uh, by the time the RAC uh, was tested in Bolivia, uh, we were already in budget support. So we thought that was a good program to try to see whether we were achieving something in terms of, of capacity building. That was a budget support program. You know that this is difficult to evaluate. We could not go into a full evaluation of, of a budget support program because it's something not obvious, but also when you evaluate uh, a budget support program, normally you evaluate the results of the policy and what your, your money is doing in terms of, of policy objectives, but they tend to ignore the capacity building aspect, so because they are small in terms term of, of money. So we took that, uh, um, Enzo and Mari Carmen, uh, I suppose they did a previous work, but from the delegation point of view, they came to Bolivia. I think they stayed there for two weeks. Uh, we met with everybody. We went with the ministry, we met with the beneficiaries, with the delegation, with the with the company that was providing the uh, our technical assistance program. We watched integration, I believe. And after two weeks, we had a, a diagnosis of, of our capacity building program and what things have we achieved in terms of institutionality, what of the learning has stayed with the institution, what of the learning stayed with individuals in the institution, and some of them had left to another ministry, because in Bolivia people rotated a lot. Uh, how was our our consultant for technical assistance doing, well or or bad? Where were the strengths of our program, and where were the weaknesses of our programs, and how could we prove? And we did this in a in a inclusive, comprehensive way, talking to everybody and meeting everybody at the end, so that after two weeks we came out with with a conclusion of what do we have to do to keep on improving this capacity building. The results of the capacity building, I have to say they were good and this is not my merit. The, the, the people who started the program was much before my time. But uh, in that meeting, we had the ministry, we had the beneficiaries and they all agreed, okay, from now on capacity building is going to go like this, like this, like that, because this is good for all. So uh, they, they bought the idea. It was the ownership of, of the process that came after the RAC. Uh, was was very high, and everybody was with the idea. So it was very easy for the delegation to implement what came afterwards. It was not it was not something imposed by the EU. It was not some international consultants that uh, come here and tell the poor Bolivians how do they need to do things. It was something built with them and built with them in two weeks. I mean, for me, it was a dream. I mean, I was used to evaluation of whatever, and then uh, you tender, and then it takes a year to evaluate something. And then by the time you get the results, the program has disappeared, or you don't know what, or the minister, the minister has changed. There was high involvement of the ministry at the very high levels. I mean, the, the, the vice minister was present in many meetings, and, and the conclusions got to the minister. So I thought that from then on, we would be doing this in every budget support program because it was a fantastic tool for the delegation. Uh, however, 
my impression is that we haven't used it too much. And, and I'm here to tell you that it's easy, it's cheap, it's effective, uh, and, and, and it puts you in a much better position in your policy dialogue to achieve the capacity development objectives that, that you have in mind. And, and that when you present your, your disbursement dossier to your director at the end of the year, uh, at the end of the year, being able to, to highlight three or four good things that you've done in your capacity building, it takes you a very long way. That's more or less it for me, Mari Carmen. I don't know if yeah, no, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And indeed, I mean, this RAC methodology is, uh, is public. I mean, it, it is on the internet, it's on the capacity for dev. And from what we know, uh, it has been used, uh, but very, uh, very rarely. But uh, at least from uh, what I know, it has been used, but not even by uh, by commission staff, but actually by uh, NGOs or civil society organizations outside. Uh, so uh, so it's really a pity indeed. And I hope that after this webinar, colleagues will actually be more inclined to use it. Um, so so thank you, thank you very much, Paco. Now, I mean, uh, if you have uh, some questions, uh, just uh, let us know before we start the uh, the second part of the webinar. And so, if you want to continue, then I can complement if needed. Uh... Okay. Uh, just a few words uh, uh, to, to the questions of Federica. Uh, I think that RAC can be applied to all the situations in which there are institutions involved and there is a, a program, because RAC uh, is uh, uh, an assessment, not uh, uh, a general institutional assessment, but is an assessment of the uh, capacity process uh, during and uh, for the implementation of a given development intervention. Uh, but of course, it may be applied to the commission, to NGOs, uh, to any other institution. On the other question, uh, on the uh, complementarity, yes, this is absolutely complementary because of course as Paco said right now uh, it helped a lot in identifying the strengths and weaknesses of the intervention but it was not a rough evaluation of the intervention so it is recommended as a complement uh, it doesn't replace of course the journey of the car but it just helps uh, understanding uh, whether the car is able to complete the journey in due time. Uh, so um, I am a, a bit surprised that it was not so much used, but probably it should be emphasized that uh, its most important use is the use, uh, direct use by the delegations to check the uh, involvement of uh, institution, to check the capacity development output and outcomes of an intervention. In few weeks, you can assess these so important things and probably uh, revision the engine of, uh, of the, the, the car in order to uh, uh, increase the speed and the performance. Okay, I finished. Okay, thank you, Enzo. And maybe to complement what Enzo was saying, I think it's, uh, again, very important to remind. So the RAC is, re is not an evaluation of the intervention and is not even an evaluation of the technical assistance component of, uh, of, an, evalu of, uh, of an intervention. So it's really, it's an assessment of the effect that the interaction of different bodies, individuals, organizations with an intervention actually uh, promotes and, uh, and develops. So it's, it's, it's really that. So it's the, the assessment of the uh, related capacities that just the interaction with an intervention promotes. But again, it's not an evaluation of the technical assistance and it's for sure not an evaluation of the intervention. Okay, so this I just wanted to, um, 
to clarify another time. Okay, so this uh, this second part is an intro introduction of the of the four uh, four steps. So as you will see, step one, which is the one that will be covered now by Enso, is on the assessment of the opportunity framework and the quality criteria on, on the design of the intervention. The second one is on the assessment of capacity outputs. The third one on the outcomes, and then the fourth one is the actual uh, correlation between the capacity output and the outcomes. And with this, I give the floor to Enzo. Uh, so this is uh, the, the first step, as uh, Marie-Carmen Marie said, uh, consists in the assessment of the opportunity framework and uh, the quality criteria. The assessment of the opportunity framework is uh, uh, something uh, uh, larger than just the assessment of the context, because it's an assessment of the context uh, in order to highlight the factors that could facilitate the implementation of the intervention and factors that could hamper the implementation of the intervention. That's why instead of calling it the assessment of context, we call it the assessment of the opportunity frame. Of course, the assessment of the opportunity framework regards uh, the country political and strategic frameworks, uh, uh, the EU uh, country partnership, the situation in the region, etc. Uh, but also some issues of uh, political economy, uh, sectoral context, and so on and so forth. Of course, these are not in-depth analysis, but are analysis uh, aimed at identifying the macro factors that could uh, influence positively or negatively an intervention. The assessment of the quality criteria, uh, which is part of this first step as well, uh, regards the uh, what we uh, call the criteria, uh, the quality criteria. Uh, these are criteria of the quality of the intervention that may be uh, favorable more or less to the capacity development. So we distinguish here four criteria. The first two criteria, one and two, uh, fits to the context and responds to a demand and political commitment are uh, a continuation of the assessment of the opportunity framework, but this time from the point of view of the intervention. The third uh, quality criteria regards specifically the, uh, the, the capacity development actions included in the intervention. Does the intervention has uh, aims at achieving specific efforts in terms of capacity development and therefore does it have specific actions to improve capacity development or not? The fourth and fifth criteria regard uh, something that we could call the uh, independence and initiative of uh, the intervention, the, the way in which the intervention stimulate the independence and the initiative of the recipient, which are factors which are absolutely favorable to capacity development. And so we have an assessment at uh, country level uh, to see uh, how much, to what extent, the uh, government is in the driving seat of the intervention and to what extent the technical assistance provided by the intervention and therefore the capacity development actions uh, are based on a peer-to-peer -peer and not on a top-down uh, approach. They are exchanges of know-how. Uh, for instance, people are invited to, to visit or to receive visits from uh, similar institutions from other countries uh, so as to learn. People are uh, pushed to, to study the experiences of other countries. So it is something a peer-to-peer -peer relationship and not uh, someone is uh, uh, a technical assistance may help uh, either uh, to write a law and then go away 
or to uh, train the people in how to, to, to draft the law and uh, how to uh, set the, 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 the essential base for its implementation. So uh, the quality of uh, the technical assistance and capacity development actions, if any. And now uh, the second step, which is on the assessment of, of capacity outputs. Uh, as Enzo mentioned already, these are the, the changes in the internal competences and skills uh, that are found at both individual and institutional level. And here, for those of you that have uh, experience with bias support, you will see that uh, we are using also um, uh, pretty much the same wording. And we consider that when, when these outputs are actually associated with, uh, with the specific support actions, we refer to them as diet outputs. So it this can be the improved knowledge in uh, X and, uh, and Y, or for example, the uh, systematis improved systematization of information. But then we also have other type of, uh, of outputs, and these are those that are uh, conceived more as a second order or as a, an indirect consequences or consequence sorry, of, the, uh, of the support intervention of the outcomes. And they are therefore induced outputs. And this can be uh, new functions that uh, can actually be fulfilled by the upgraded staff uh, without, uh, the benefit, without additional uh, capacity development um, inputs or, or outputs. This can also be uh, changes in the uh, institutional setup, in the institutional structure of, that have been promoted or facilitated by the intervention. Here, for example, we can think about the, uh, the creation of a new uni unit, for example, the creation of a monitoring evaluation unit, or the uh, reduction of organizational overlapping, or even the adoption of a more decentralized uh, structure. And in the RAC, I mean, of course, we, we gather all the, um, all the capacity output that have been um, promoted or facilitated by the, uh, by the interaction with the, with the intervention, but it's true that, uh, I mean, for the RAC, the most important ones are those that we qualify as uh, induced um, induce outputs. And then the third uh, step is on the assessment of, uh, is on the assessment of the capacity outcomes. And uh, well, here, these are the capacities that are actually necessary for the accomplishment of the institution's mission. So beyond the duration of any given um, external support. And this is, uh, this is uh, very key. In fact, there was a question last week on uh, whether the RAC can, uh, can actually only be used for a for a government because I mean in the in the test that we did in Bolivia it's true that it was around the bias support program so the main uh, stakeholders were uh, from the public administration but of course not I mean the RAC can actually be develop uh, for any kind of, uh, of, uh, of institution, be it uh, a government, but also, uh, I mean, a ministry, a department, or uh, a small NGO, an international organization, uh, or a specific department in this international organization. It can also be applied, of course, to the, to the commission. So, and this is key because as you will, um, as you can see already on the screen, we have defined, and this is also pretty much based on what uh, the work of ECDPM uh, on the five uh, capabilities, we have defined five typologies of uh, capacity outcomes and, and as you will see they are pretty relevant to any kind of, of institution but they are really necessary for the for a, any given institution to perform their their um, their mission and uh, of course the capacity outcomes they are uh, the se sequential effect of the of the output so they, they actually help us to determine uh, the effectiveness and efficiency of this uh, output and their analysis actually allows understanding the possible problems in the generation of the of the outputs now we are going to see one by one so if you can go to the next uh, okay so so the first typology of capacity outcome, this is the what we have called survive and act. And this actually is the capacity to generate plans, to reflect on needs, on the mission, and to, uh, and to consider change in uh, context. It's actually also the, the capacity to mobilize um, uh, resources and the management to execute them. And as you can see, as uh, some examples, you can have the increased autonomy in reporting and uh, analysis and management of indicators. You can also have uh, the increased capacity for seeking diversified funding uh, sources. So this is the first uh, typology. The second one is on, on achieving results. So it's the capacity to achieve results in a sustainable uh, way. So results that are stated either in a national development or in a um, sector policy, but also if we apply this RAC to any to an NGO or any other uh, non-state actor. Uh, so in this case, it would be the, the capacity to actually achieve the results that are uh, part of their own uh, strategies and, uh, and plans. And uh, as an example, uh, you can see um, here, for example, the increased sector leadership and position in a given uh, institution. 
Then as a third the typology of capacity outcome, we have the capacity to network. So actually the capacity to act in a coordinated and efficient manner as, a, as part of a larger uh, network of interested and relevant stakeholders. And of course, this, this capacity outcome also involves the, uh, the capacity to uh, share knowledge. And you can also see on the right uh, hand some, uh, some examples. Then the fourth uh, typology of capacity outcome is the capacity to self-renew. So it's the capacity uh, to actually adapt to a change in environment or adapt to a, to a change in available resources. And is what is key for us here is that this um, uh, typology actually requires a reflective act because it's true that maybe you can self-renew from de facto, uh, I mean, without any 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 obligation, let's say, of really conceiving a new strategy. So here we are referring to a um, uh, to a capacity that actually actually requires a reflection and a due definition of a of an adaptation uh, strategy, let's say. And you can also see here on the on the right some uh, some examples such as uh, the generation of alternative solutions, or also the capacity of beneficiaries to uh, to correct or reorient uh, resources allocation. And uh, then the last uh, typology of capacity outcomes that we have is actually the one that puts together the other four. So the, the one that actually puts together the, uh, the strategic and the operational um, level. So the one that actually put in place policy management frameworks that build upon each other. So uh, this is also key. And also a, a basic example, a simple one is, for example, here, the, the coherence between the policy development and the budgetary uh, policy. Then the fourth uh, and last uh, typology of, um, sorry, the first, the first and last uh, step, sorry, uh, is the one on the correlation between the outputs and the uh, and the outcomes. So here, what we uh, refer to is the uh, is the identification of the of the causal links between the be, between the two, so between the cap, the um, the capacity output and the outcome, but also the uh, the consideration of uh, of the uh, elements of the opportunity uh, of the opportunity framework. And so this correlation actually seeks to uh, outline the general trends of the impact of a support uh, intervention on capacity development. And again, here I would like to um, highlight the fact that really the RAC is not an evaluation of the technical assistance component of an intervention, it's not even the evaluation of an intervention, it's really the evaluation of, of uh, what the interaction with a given intervention has actually uh, promoted and created at individual and organizational levels. Okay, so this is, uh, this is also very important for you to keep um, in mind here. And with this, we close the second part of the presentation, which is a brief introduction on each of the four steps. And I don't know if uh, maybe now you have, uh, you have questions. So in fact, the main goal that DEFCO had 10 years ago, and it's the same one that we have now in NIR and also in IMPA, but I, we have here IMPA colleagues as well from uh, headquarters from uh, Unit D4. The goal is that we do it uh, ourselves. So we uh, commission staff do the RACA uh, rock ourselves. And this presentation is, uh, is supposed to help you doing that, as you will see mostly now in the last part, because there you will see how each of these steps is actually performed. Uh, but then, of course, I mean, if you are not um, at ease to do a RAC now or yourself, the option is actually to uh, completely externalize it. And so in this case, yes, you will need to hire a, a small team. But again, we don't think that it requires much of uh, work because we have already developed the, uh, the TOR to, uh, to actually uh, contract a, a RAC. So this is already there. Uh, we will just uh, need to see some um, some uh, some adaptations issues of, of this TOR with uh, with office colleagues. But I mean the, the TOR, which is something that requires time, is already there. It's just uh, you will just need to adapt it uh, a little bit, and then you will just sign the contract, and then that's it. Uh, and as we as we said before, in up to two months, the the rack is done. So it's uh, I mean compared to uh, our other tools, I believe. Uh, but I don't know. Also, Paco, you also know the rack uh, compared to the other tools that we have. Have, launching evaluations, uh, whatever type, I mean, intervention evaluations or strategic, I mean, it's pretty, uh, pretty quick. But again, here, I mean, you have different options. So either you undertake the RAC yourself with maybe the support of a national expert or you fully externalize it. But in both cases, it doesn't take uh, much time. And uh, maybe when once uh, once we finish with this presentation, when we, we will send you the PowerPoint presentation, you will see the links and you will actually see uh, the, uh, the TOR uh, template, also the RAC uh, questionnaire as we will show now in the last part. So 
really it doesn't take uh, much time. I don't know if maybe Paco, you want to add. Yeah, I mean, uh, our contractual procedures have become what they have become. And now doing a contract of 20,000 is more complicated than doing an international tender. Uh, the advantage of, of the RAC is that you have the possibility to do it yourself. Now, um, most of the times we don't find the time to dedicate ourselves 21 days to something full time. And if you have to contract, then uh, the options is the framework contract or, or, or a local contract with, with a local consultant. In any case, you would be in the same position as in evaluation with the difference that an evaluation normally takes one year, the last one I did with a committee with uh, different phases, while the RAC would take you much more. I mean, the, the mission, I don't know, Carmen, with the preparation, the mission in the country was two weeks, with the preparation months, and the reporting, yeah. maybe it's four or five weeks, and then in five weeks you have your assessment. Ideally, the commission would also have a simple method to do a contract for less than 20,000, but these days I don't. I mean, it's, but this has not to do with the methodology, but with how complicated we were coming. Thank you, Paco. I don't know. Uh, offices need a lot of time if it rains. I agree. Okay, let's be a bit well, more uh, well, 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 optimistic. Well, we, can, we can do another <laughs> we have the office and yes, framework contract. But uh, IT bags will uh, are disappearing uh, slowly. So yeah, let's be optimistic. Uh, I just want to say that this is a very pragmatic tool. Uh, of course, we don't have uh, a project because uh, uh, so with the uh, inputs, outputs uh, and outcomes uh, of capacity, uh, we don't have a baseline. Uh, so we can't carry out an evaluation of uh, the capacity development uh, we can carry out only an evaluation of the intervention as such, and within the intervention also some uh, considerations about capacity development. But RAC is not an evaluation. RAC is a very pragmatic tool uh, through which we ask, fundamentally we ask person and try to reconstruct with the persons and the institutions the uh, path of uh, uh, professional growth that they have undertaken and accomplished uh, during the, the implementation of the intervention. So they will be themselves that uh, can say, can help uh, understanding where we were and where we are. Uh, probably we are at the same point or uh, we did some progress, uh, but uh, in this field, in this area, not in, in the other one. Etc. So it's uh, it's mainly a self-assessment process, uh, which uh, refers to a grid of key points that should be considered by those that uh, lead the process. Uh, so I, I just can say that I understand your point. And so, if if I may, um, apart from the professional growth of the persons, you were also assessing how much of that have remained in the organization as organizational knowledge so it's, it's not not only to look at the person yeah i just wanted to mention uh, on, on this on the part of how you mobilize, mobilize the experts if you need experts uh, there's another possibility which nowadays most countries have a uh, support measures with a contract providing clinical assistance for several Things you could use the non key experts days in that contract to mobilize 21 days quickly in a week to do this job because this job, of course, they cannot auto assess themselves. So it should not be for that support program. But if you have, for instance, a technical assistant in a sector and a general contract providing general assistance, which was the case in Bolivia, you could use the non key experts days in, in that contract and to try to do a rack. On a sector tier for capacity building program, and that would be really quick and not in OPSIS, so you can do it with a letter. <laughs> with an email. Okay, very good idea indeed. 
So unless there are other uh, questions, maybe I propose that we continue, uh, Camila, to the next uh, slide. So this is the last, uh, the third and last part of the presentation on how to carry out uh, the first step. So what are the main questions that need to be asked uh, for each of the steps and what are the main uh, data collection um, uh, tools? So um, what we want is actually to orient uh, data collection. Uh, and for that uh, purpose, we have identified key, uh, key questions. Of course, the questions that we are going to present now, they are not uh, to be considered as static questions. Of course, they are to be further uh, developed uh, with the gather uh, information in the different uh, interviews. But we believe that with, uh, with these questions, uh, you will actually uh, be able, or the external, if you uh, choose to actually fully externalize the rack, the, uh, the team will actually guide the process in a very simple, uh, simple way. And also here is very important to, uh, to know that uh, when undertaking a rack, uh, we always need to use a very simple language. So we, we need to avoid the technicalities. We need uh, to avoid referring to a capacity outcome or uh, to a capacity output, because these are maybe understood um, just by, uh, by uh, a limited audience. So we need to speak always in terms of learning. So the learning path, as Enzo and Paco were saying before, is the learning path of an individual or of an organization. And, and so um, again, keep a very simple, uh, simple language Then it will be for the consultant to maybe structure uh, actually everything, uh, all the results of the interviews, the workshop and the questionnaire to structure them around the capacity output, the capacity outcomes. And we believe that with the definition that we give in this material, and also with, um, with the fact that in the end, these capacities have a sequential uh, logic, it will be very easy for the, uh, for the consultant to actually be able to, um, uh, to uh, structure well all the results. So in terms of capacity output or, or outcome. Uh, here in this slide, you can actually see uh, the first steps and the different uh, data collection tools. So as you can see, the first uh, step is the one that is done before going to the to the field. So uh, this is the one that we did before uh, going for two weeks in uh, in Bolivia. So we uh, we assess the the different uh, the key documentation on the intervention uh, uh, stake. We also under step one, we also um, um, uh, undertook uh, some individual and collective uh, interviews. Then in uh, in step two and three you you have also the what we have called the co-coaching and now you will you will understand uh, why, and then of course we also use the standard rack uh, questionnaire to actually feed and uh, and guide also our, our interviews, and then the uh, the fourth step uh, the last one is actually just about our workshop, and now I give the floor to Enzo again for the first step. Thank you. I introduced the first uh, assessment that should be formulated, which is the assessment of the opportunity framework and the quality criteria. Uh, before entering into the uh, content, I wish to uh, deepen a little bit the very interesting team uh, introduced by Karen. Uh, which is the difference between uh, this uh, method and an evaluation. This is a method for the program managers that at the beginning may be launched through some specialized consultants to train the program managers to uh, carry out this, uh, this uh, method alone but it's fundamentally a tool for the program manager and all the things that we say here are just a grid of reference for the program manager to carry out these assessments and uh, we provide the, the program manager with the definition of the capacities we provide them with a, uh, an illustration of the distinction between capacity outputs and capacity outputs but uh, the, the part of assessment is a self-assessment part. So uh, that said, uh, and I repeat, I want to thank Karen because this was a very important uh, issue to underline. Uh, that said, uh, the assessment of the opportun opportunity framework. Well, there are some simple questions that uh, we should uh, respond to. Which was the degree of fertilization of development capacity at the beginning of the intervention? Uh, this means uh, which was the level of uh, uh, capacity, and uh, this uh, may be identified uh, through uh, self-assessment as well, which was uh, the level 
which was the, the context, uh, the opportunity framework that, uh, in which the intervention was conceived. The second question is, uh, if the intervention included specific actions for individuals and institutional capacity development. The third question is, uh, which are the political, institutional, sectoral factor that have facilitated or negatively affected the intervention? For instance, I want to give an example, which is the opposite of the example that will, that has been developing and will develop as well, uh, Paco, uh, is the test that we did in Ukraine. In Ukraine, uh, we found uh, that uh, we, we focused on an intervention of uh, rural development, which aimed at uh, the assimilation of uh, the uh, Ukrainian framework, policy framework, uh, and also legislations and uh, institutions to the European uh, model of the rural development policy, a sort of a preliminary program before launching a uh, SAPARD in Ukraine. This was 2013 and 2014. Uh, the intervention, if I'm not wrong, was in 2013. Just a few months before uh, the, after, sorry, the starting of the intervention, the Yanukovych government shifted from uh, a priority given to the association with the EU towards a, a priority given to the association with Russia. So it is evident that uh, the program in its uh, foundation didn't have uh, any, any more sense in its policy uh, foundations for which it was conceived. Uh, well, it was decided not to interrupt the program, and even the, the government has a, had a certain interest in the program. And at the end, the program on the policy side was a failure because the government was no more interested in uh, supporting the uh, European uh, uh, approach to rural development, the institutions uh, didn't consider that anymore a priority and so on and so forth. So the progresses made in terms of policy were uh, very, very little and the capacity of the individuals and the institution didn't improve at all because they were thinking at other things. The uh, individuals were dispersed uh, around their own specific career, uh, looking for institutions that were much more priority institution than that one. But on the other side, the uh, institutions and individuals learned a lot of things because uh, uh, they learned, for instance, what is and how to set an health quality, uh, uh, an animal health system. Uh, they uh, understood what was about uh, a food safety system. And uh, even the institution created some institutions that didn't respond anymore to rural development, but they uh, addressed these contexts. So there was a, a capacity output which was significantly recognized by the individuals and institutions, but there was no capacity outcome because these individuals, these institutions didn't use that for policy development, for the development of their uh, initiative, independence, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, uh, so this is uh, uh, an assessment of the opportunity framework. Now, coming to the uh, uh, quality criteria, uh, well, even this policy criteria should be assessed based on the project document and uh, some interviews. But if, uh, if uh, they are not available, they, it's not possible in that way, we do it uh, again through a self-assessment with uh, the stakeholders of the intervention, both individuals and institutions. So we can arrive to uh, a credible uh, assessment of uh, uh, the quality criteria of the intervention as well as uh, the opportunity framework. We uh, suggest to summarize, uh, because uh, as Marie Carmen said at the beginning of this part, 
uh, we had uh, we have several steps. We have uh, the uh, individual conclusions. We have the individual interviews. We have the institutional interviews. We have the coaching and co-coaching. And then we have a, a global seminar in which we summarize all these elements. In order to prepare this conclusion, we need to uh, summarize the key issues related to opportunity framework and quality criteria. And we can uh, divide, uh, at least this was a practical tool that we used the success for other people may use other practical tool to divide the positive and negative factors according to institutional level, intervention level, and policy partnership framework. Uh, doing so, we can use always this, uh, these issues, uh, both in the prosecution of the interviews and in the seminar, in the conclusion seminar. Thank you, Enzo. And now the, the second step, the, the assessment of the capacity outputs. Here, what we need to do first is actually to value the different learning sources to establish them. And so uh, we ask the uh, participants to, to think about their, uh, the, um, I mean, their, their experience uh, gained through the education, to think about the previous uh, work experience, to think about the current work, and uh, lastly, to think about the, uh, the experience of the work, of the current work and the interaction with the support intervention. And all this, we, we believe, actually is what um, uh, fits the, uh, the capacities that uh, an individual uh, has. And then after they have thought about these uh, four, uh, four sources of capacity, what we ask them is uh, what they have as individual and in, within their own institutions learned in, in their interaction with, um, with the intervention. So these are the two major uh, questions uh, of, um, of this uh, step. Now, uh, how do we do that? So so for that, we uh, we use individual and collective interviews with the key stakeholders. In the in this case, in the case of Bolivia, it was with the ministry in charge of the drug uh, policy. Then we also uh, do uh, co-coaching, and we will have more details now in the next uh, slide. And this co-coaching is actually, I mean, we gather a group of uh, of persons of a same institution that actually collaborates or interacts with the uh, with the intervention. And uh, as uh, as we have been saying uh, during this. Uh, webinar and this is really a tool for uh, for a dialogue tool so it's a peer-to-peer -peer exchange this is very uh, very key then we also use as another tool the RAC uh, standard questionnaire that uh, is already available again and that is, is also to be adapted based on the gather information from uh, from uh, from uh, from the first round of, of interviews then of course this uh, standard questionnaire is also used uh, to guide the second round of, of interviews so these are really the the tools that are used in uh, in step two now we go to the next um next slide so here first of all before uh, undertaking the coaching what uh, what you need to do is actually to um, to have a, an interview with the hierarchical person in charge of the institution uh, with whom you uh, with, uh, you actually want to undertake this coaching because this hierarchical uh, person will also need to participate in this uh, co-coaching and at the same level of, of the other person so because again this is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, dialogue the specific positions or post uh, hierarchical status of any given uh, uh, individual are not really uh, important for this uh, for this exercise but anyway before you undertake this coaching it's important to set the basis for uh, for uh, for the coaching with the hierarchical person and so how is this done so uh, there is a brief individual exercise so we uh, we ask the um, the persons uh, to actually put in a sheet of, uh, of paper and uh, the the four sources of, uh, of capacity that we were mentioning mentioning before, so the university, the previous work, the current work, and also the current the interaction between the current work and the uh, interaction with the intervention. And we ask them to assign a specific percentage, uh, totally, in, of course, up to 100 uh, percentage uh, to each of these sources. So in terms of capacity, which one of these sources, uh, what is the, the level the, the, the level of each of these sources for their uh, what they consider to be their uh, current uh, capacity. So this is uh, the first exercise. It's about uh, five minutes. Then. Uh, there is a work to be done in Kapor and, and I mean, in, fa in fact, for that, I mean, there is a minimum of four persons that need to participate in this uh, coaching. So there's a work in, uh, in couples, uh, so A and B. 
So uh, A and B, they exchanged the sheet papers that uh, were um, uh, fulfilled uh, in the previous uh, five minutes exercise. And then here, A asked to B about the reasoning behind the, the percentage distribution that he has put in, in, uh, in, the, in the paper. And actually he asked B to focus on the current uh, work experience and on, the, uh, on his interaction with the intervention. And he also asked to provide, uh, so A asked to B to provide actually concrete examples and actually A then uh, writes them uh, down in uh, B, uh, B, uh, B's uh, paper. And then after, uh, after this, which is also a very uh, um, quick exercise, it's a five minute exercise, uh, a says to B, uh, again, with concrete examples, uh, what A thinks have been actually the, 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 main, um, the main learnings that he has observed in, uh, in B, thanks to the interaction of the uh, intervention uh, of B, and, uh, and that were not part of uh, B's uh, paper. And then if B agrees, then uh, these uh, additional capacities are actually put, uh, put uh, on paper. And then uh, there is a work group. I mean, there is uh, each participant actually uh, briefs on what has happened in the, um, in the, in the exercise. And, and they mention, I mean, each participant is expected to mention what have been the most important uh, learnings acquired uh, thanks to the interaction with the intervention. And then, of course, the co-coaching is, uh, I mean, the roles are uh, reversed, so B ask A and uh, et cetera. So I hope that this gives you um, gives you uh, an idea on how this uh, co-coaching was uh, was performed. Maybe it seems complicated like this, but it's, it was actually very, uh, very easy. And uh, one of the added values that we saw when we did that in uh, in Bolivia is that since this, uh, these questions, I mean, uh, the questions, but really for the different Different steps, not only for the capacity output, but maybe more for the capacity output and for, for, for capacity outcomes. Since these questions tend to be pretty uh, basic, they, they are anyway, anyway questions that uh, uh, none of them was actually uh, used to, um, to ask himself. And so they, uh, they, with these simple questions, we, uh, we allow them to actually think think about their uh, professional path and their uh, and their growth and learning path so it was very uh, it was a very um, uh, stimulating exercise for the for the participants then uh, yes we can go to the next uh, step here on the you can okay thank you here for the capacity assessment of the capacity outcomes what is the the preliminary question is actually on, on uh, of what you um, you have learned what are the what are you using in your daily work also outside of the intervention uh, sphere and then the second question will be how, when, and where are we? Um, are you using it? Are we using it? And again, how is this uh, done? So this is done uh, via the same. You can go to the next uh, slide. This is done via the same uh, individual and collective interviews because, as I was saying uh, before, we don't ask the participants to reflect in terms of output or outcome. I mean, we just uh, ask them to reflect in terms of their learning path. So, I mean, the same interviews and the same coaching can actually uh, allow um, the external team or the, the person performing the RAC or facilitating the RAC to actually gather the, uh, the specific capacity uh, results. So. We use the same uh, interviews. We also use the same um, the same uh, coaching exercise, and of course, we also use the uh, the standard uh, rack that again is adapted based on uh, on the uh, on the findings on the results of the previous um, previous uh, interviews. And how do we do that? So uh, here again, um, I mean, I, I leave you. I mean, you have already this on the on the slide. So here there is also a, another work on uh, in couple uh, changing partners. This uh, yes, I mean, this is something that we recommend. And then for about five minutes, they um, they interchange this uh, the the different groups. They interchange uh, observations and experiences from uh, one or two concrete examples of organizational uh, learning. And here, what we uh, ask them, what we want them is actually to reply to two. Um, uh, basic uh, questions. So what, is, what the office or the unit or the department uh, you adapted to your own specific case does better since it's participating in the intervention and which ones of the individual and organizational learnings acquired have been used or are used outside of the interventions uh, sphere. Again, we also, we always ask for uh, providing, uh, for the provision of, uh, of examples. And, um, and then again, there is a work uh, in group and each participant actually gives examples of the organizational uh, learning and uh, the, the groups, the, the two persons group are, I mean, the roles are uh, reversed. Then uh, the last step, again, uh, this is on the on the correlation uh, between the outputs and the outcome. And here, the main question is, uh, which are the specific capacity outputs currently used 
for the development of specific uh, outcomes. Of course, we simplify it a bit based on what they have said to us. Uh, and then again, this is done uh, via a workshop. So this step is actually, yes, mainly focused on, on this uh, workshop. Uh, and actually this workshop uh, is organized at the very end of the RAC exercise, so at the, at the end of the two weeks in, uh, in the field. And uh, what we um, want to achieve with this workshop uh, is actually to have an in-depth and joint uh, analysis of the, as Enzo was saying before, of uh, the enabling uh, factors and also of the capacity outputs and, and outcomes. And here in depth and joint are key, uh, key terms uh, because here in this uh, workshop we invite not only uh, delegation uh, uh, staff, but of course also national counterparts uh, in charge, of, in charge, I mean, that interact with the intervention, but we also invited uh, other, uh, other donors. So this is a very uh, inclusive uh, gathering. And uh, the workshop actually helps us to uh, prioritize, to specify, and to complete, and probably add, and this actually happened in, in Bolivia, the capacity outputs and the outcomes that were identified in the previous uh, steps. And again, this is done in, uh, in dialogue uh, between uh, all of the participants. As Enzo was also saying uh, before, I mean, all of these steps, they are, they are undertaken by, by the stakeholders themselves. So this is really a self-analysis. Uh, self so again, also for this step four, the correlation analysis that is done in this, uh, in this workshop is done by the, by the stakeholders uh, themselves. So um, and what do we do? So uh, before the, the workshop, actually, the evaluation team or the uh, team that facilitates uh, the external team, let's say, what they uh, need to do is that they need to list uh, the capacity output and the capacity outcomes from the previous uh, steps, and they create two different sheets. So one for individual capacities and one for uh, organizational capacities. And in each uh, sheet, there are two different columns. Uh, and in the first column, uh, the list of capacity outputs is, is written. And then in the second column, the list of uh, capacity outcomes. And so the prioritization exercise that is done again by each of the uh, participants in the just take uh, in the in the workshop. This prioritization exercise actually focuses more on the uh, individual and uh, and collective perceptions. Okay, and the correlation exercise that is then uh, done, as you will see now, is actually um, has the main aim of providing more quantitative uh, information. And then uh, the participants they are asked to uh, to complete the two uh, sheets by actually uh, linking with um, with arrows uh, the column on the capacity output with the column on the capacity and for sure, one capacity output can be linked to one or more uh, of, uh, of the capacity outcomes. And we ask them to provide the, the list of the what they consider to be the main uh, 10 uh, correlations. So again, this is really fully done by, uh, by them. And then once this is done, once the workshop is, uh, is done, the last step is, uh, is to elaborate a, a small note. And again, we, uh, we already established in the TUR uh, a standard format uh, for this uh, note. And um, what this note presents uh, is really the findings of the different stages of the, of the RAC. And it actually uses the results and the, the outcomes of the, of the workshop to complete the analysis and to mainly to prioritize and to, um, and to, uh, and to put more, uh, more examples on the capacity outputs and the capacity outcomes. And also, as you, uh, when you will receive this uh, PowerPoint, you will also have a link to the, uh, for, uh, for your perusal to, this, uh, to the uh, note that we did for the Bolivia, Bolivia RAC. And now we give the floor again to Paco to share his experience uh, on the on the rack. Over to you, Paco. Thank you. Indeed, uh, I mean, uh, no, I will not talk about outputs and outcomes, and uh, I don't know what is the science before the methodology, but just just how it worked for us. Um, First thing to say is that all this that is explained in 49 slides uh, happens in two weeks. So it's actually longer to explain it in a PowerPoint than actually do it. <laughs> uh, now, when they talk about change of context, to, to explain this, um, I need to explain what we were trying to do and uh, why the capacity building was there. As I said, there was a big change of context. We wanted to move with the government from a policy where if you are planting coca, you're a criminal, we will put you in jail, we'll make raids with armed police and we will arrest people. And if they resist, we will shoot. 
and uh, we will spray the coca fields from planes with glyphosate and we will kill all the coca uh, leaves, all the coca plants. But of course, the spraying fields, we will also kill the tomatoes, the bananas, the coffee, whatever you've planted. So you will be poorer. Now, the result of all this was big social conflicts and that's what made Evo Morales famous and a lot of poverty because Okay, you destroy all the all the fields with whatever they were planting. A farmer has to restart from zero. What is he going to plant? Coca, because in three weeks, in three months, you have your fair harvest. If you replant with coffee, uh, you have to wait five years. So it was not a very effective policy. I mean, uh, in Bolivia and in Peru, they've been planting coca for 300 years and coca was not being reduced. So Evo Morales came with a new policy and explaining that this was also a problem of poverty and say, well, in Bolivia, there are legal uses of coca leaves, which are our traditional uses, which is chewing the coca, which is rituals for, for talking to mother earth and talking to the gods, which are medicinal uses. And they even use coca for making cakes, for making sweets making shampoo, making creams when you are bitten by a mosquito. So first thing they ask uh, the EU is let's do a scientific survey in Bolivia to understand how much coca we need for legal uses. So we made a survey with, uh, I think it was 50,000 interviews. How much coca do you use a week to, for chewing? How much do you use for rituals, et cetera, et cetera? And we came up after a lot of discussion with more or less 20,000 hectares were needed for the national consumption on legal uses that were not drug trafficking. Um, at the time when I arrived in Bolivia, instead of 20,000, Bolivia had 40,000 hectares. So, uh, twice as much. So 20,000 hectares were being diverted to drugs, to narco traffic. When I left, Bolivia had 23,000. And that was the objective of this program in particular, was to reduce the coca field through alternative development. So Co uh, Evo Morales said, uh, you are entitled to plant coca if you want. You can plant a maximum of a field of 40 meters by 40 meters. This is six, 1,600 square meters, because they calculated that that would give a minimum salary. That would be the equivalent of a minimum salary. If you take the harvest three or four times a year of 1,600 square meters, that would give the equivalent of a minimum salary in Bolivia. In order to do this, you have to be registered as a coca farmer with a biometric uh, identity card that identifies where is your plot and, and therefore identifies your plot as a legal plot, uh, how much you can produce, how much you can transport to the market to sell it, et cetera, et cetera. And then we, the government, will help you uh, in the development. There is, an, there is an excess of coca at the moment, and we don't want drugs in our country. We want coca sacred leaves. So in order to do this, instead of raids and spraying your fields and anything like that, you, all the coca farmers will go into a trade union. And we, the state, will negotiate with the trade union, and we will go to your municipality and say, Okay, you have so many farmers, you have 1,000 farmers, they are entitled to 1,600 square meters, so you can have in this municipality 1 million point six square meters of coca. At the moment you have 3 million, so we need a plan by which you reduce by 30% next year, by 30% the other years, and then in three years you will have 1.6 million, which is the legal amount. In order to do that, we will negotiate with the trade union, not with individual farmers. And you, the trade union, will tell us, okay, we have an excess in order to comply. We want you to eradicate this field here of Mr. Perez and this field there of Mr. Sanchez. And when we go eradicating, we will sign, instead of using the force, we will sign an agreement, uh, uh, a paper between the farmer, the trade union, the military who are eradicating, and this will be an agreed process without violence, et cetera, et cetera. As long as the municipality, the trade union, fulfills the reduction plans, we will maintain 
our alternative development program, which is paid by the EU. And alternative development doesn't mean that we replace your coca by bananas and we give you bananas. No, alternative development means the development in this municipality needs markets, needs a bridge, needs a new road, needs a school, needs health, needs uh, new products, needs markets, needs export promotion strategies or whatever. So it was a comprehensive development with coca, they call it, because coca would be allowed. Okay, problems of this first. International legislation, there is a 1961 convention of the UN on, on drugs that has an annex that lists everything that is considered drugs by the international community, which included coca leaves. Coca is forbidden, is illegal. So that was the Ministry of External Affairs that went to the UN and tried to change, to modify the convention to say, listen, coca leaves are not drugs. And there's a very famous intervention by Evo Morales in the, in the annual meeting on drugs of, of this convention. It takes, in, takes place in Geneva. He went there and when he was talking to all the leaders, he took from his back a branch of coca leaves and said, this is our sacred leaf and this comes from the indigenous and our ancestors and blah, blah, blah. And say, and according to your bloody legislation, I could have been arrested in the airport for having this because this is illegal. I actually need 100 kilos of this to produce half a kilo of cocaine, which is your invention, not ours. And you would have arrested me for having this branch. That created a big scandal in the security forces in, in, in Switzerland. How could he pass with, with a forbidden product in the airport and all the controls, but made an effect. So they tried to change the convention, they didn't manage. And uh, at the end, Evo Morales took Bolivia out of the convention. We, were, we will no longer be members of your international convention of drugs, big scandal, big political thing. And then they requested re-access with an exception for Bolivia and they managed. So that was Cancillería External Affairs did the political work. Then, uh, okay, we have 40,000 hectares, we want to reduce to 20,000. The EU will pay United Nations, UNODC, to every year monitor how much coca is planted in Bolivia. Uh, they will take satellite pictures to detect the coca fields, then they will go with planes to make sure that these are coca fields. And then they will discuss with the peasants, with the farmers, okay, this is the results. It says that in your municipality, you have X. And then there will be a dialogue between the farmers and the UN saying, no, no, this that you took a picture in January from your satellite, it was coca then, but now it's tomatoes. And uh, let's go together and see. So plot by plot, they were identifying until they agreed, okay, this is the surface in Colombia. And we agree with that. That, of course, required that we did capacity building with, with the cocaleros, with the farmers, because we had to give them computers, we have to make them understand the methodology, we have to give them negotiation techniques and being able to talk equal to equal with the UN, the UNODC man. Then there was the part of the, of the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Agriculture, which is the capacity building program that we uh, assessed with Mari Carmen, was in charge of the integral development program. So they would have to negotiate with, with the municipalities, with the peasants and uh, say, what is this needed in this municipality for an effective development? Is it the schools? Is it roads? Is it markets? Is it new products? Whatever, make a plan and implement it and, and then give them the tools. Then there was the Minister of Interior, which was the one that would go and eradicate the coca with the military and the police, but not arm and that had to understand a new concept of how we work with cocaleros. In the past, cocaleros were the enemy. You arrest them, you put them in jail. Now, cocaleros are citizens of Bolivia. You go negotiate with them and you eradicate manually, not spraying. And, and, and we are friends of the cocaleros. We are the public force of the cocaleros. We are not the enemies of the cocaleros. And then you have the municipalities itself that they say, okay, now the Ministry of Agriculture, because of the coca is coming with a development plan, they're gonna make this road and they're gonna make this. So where does it put me as a municipality? I don't have to take care of the road, but then I will have to take care of the bridge or the market or whatever. 
So it was all a very complicated picture of actors, of stakeholders to one end, which was to reduce the coca surface of Bolivia to a legal, uh, legal uh, amount that would validate the policy of Evo Morales. Evo Morales was saying, my policy is much more effective to reduce drug trafficking than what the Americans are, have been doing with conservative governments for 40 years and they failed. And he wanted to prove the world that coca was not drugs and that he could stop the, the, the drug trafficking in Bolivia. To give you an idea, we said that uh, Bolivia had 40,000 hectares, out of which 20,000 were used for legal uses, so 20,000 for narco trafficking. Colombia today has 200,000 and everything is forbidden there, so it's 10 times more. Peru at the time had 60,000, so three times more. So Bolivia was a small problem, but they wanted to go to zero. So the interesting part of the assessment came after Mari Carmen and Enzo left, because we had this assessment and they say, okay, contest change, fine. Sector leadership, is the Ministry of Agriculture able to talk to the Ministry of Interior, where that is normally a much stronger ministry, and tell them don't eradicate there, you have to go and come to eradicate here because I've been negotiating with the cocaleros. Um, are they able in the Ministry of Agriculture, that is what we are assessing, work in a coordinated manner with the Ministry of External Relations, with the Presidency, Evo Morales, who is still the, the chairman of the Costa Caleros, with the municipalities, with the trade unions, with the European Union, with UNODC, and can we come up to a plan of, of, of capacity for the ministry to work with all these actors in order to reduce the coca surface, which is what they all want. Um, the the self renew. I mean, we've been doing this with a project and now we move to budget support. This is our money now. It comes into our budget. The European Union will not make an audit. Are we in a position to negotiate with the Ministry of Finance to ensure that we receive the money when we need the money to be able to meet our deadlines and our targets with the European Union so that we receive the money next year? Um, and how do we link all this together, which was the last part of the assessment, the UN, the Cocaleros, the European Union, the other donors. At the end of the two weeks, we had this, this famous uh, taller, how did you call it in English, the workshop, where the Cocaleros were there, the leaders of the trade unions were there, the municipalities were there. Uh, I have to say, uh, Coca is only allowed in seven municipalities in the Chapare and four in the Yunga, so it was 11 municipalities. If it's 1,000 municipalities, I don't know how I would have done it, but they were there, the Minister of Interior, the Chief of the Police, the military were there, um, the Ministry of External Relations, because this was the main policy. And then we came up with a self-diagnosis of, we are able to do this, but we are not able to work with the Ministry of Interior, for instance, or with the police. And uh, we have learned all this that we are using. We have learned this that we are not using. The EU has given computers to the cocaleros, but they cannot use the computers because they don't have electricity. How do we solve that? And they came with a self-assessment and with a plan that involved everybody. And after that, in our policy dialogue that was normally done at the level of the vice minister and twice a year at the level of the minister and once with the president and all the, head, the EU heads of, of mission, there was always a part to capacity development after that mission where we say, okay, we have made a plan on capacity development. You made your plan. We've been trying to help with integration with our technical assistance. Uh, company, which of course was in the in the workshop. And for this year, we said we were going to do this and this and that. How are we doing? Did we do that? What do we need? And that it completely changed the, the, the way of providing technical assistance. It was no longer a foreign company that comes to tell the Bolivians how to do things. It's some people that with the EU help us to do what we want to do. And that, that completely changed the dialogue and that created um, how to say much faster results and results that were owned by the by the Bolivian government uh, in all our capacity development program and dialogue with them. That's more or less what I had.
I don't know if I may, I didn't talk about the, the rock a lot, but just, just what it meant for us. <laughs> yeah, which is what uh, we wanted you uh, precisely for, uh, for that. So thank you very much. Plus, I didn't know all of the follow up after the rock in Bolivia. So I'm happy to learn that uh, and some details, yeah. really. So uh, colleagues, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, if you have any uh, additional question, also specifically on the Bolivian case, I mean, not just on the RAC methodology, but uh, so we are here for you. So maybe I will start and then, of course, uh, Paco and Enzo, you can uh, jump in. So this, uh, this presentation now, I mean, we have to, um, we have to thank, uh, first of all, Paco. <laughs> <laughs> because in fact, Paco, I mean, we are pretty much uh, still in contact, uh, Paco and myself. And he sent me like an email, I don't know, maybe one month ago, telling me, Mari Carmen, uh, this will make uh, your day. Have a look at this, uh, the second paragraph in this executive summary of this report. And then I, I saw it. And I saw that it was uh, a report uh, that was used in the RAC methodology, and it was a report by a, I don't know, Norwegian or a Danish uh, NGO. So I said, I said to myself, I mean, oh my God, I mean, I've been here in the commission for six years, and the only thing that I had, the only thing that I have um, uh, done in order to, let's say, promote the RAC was uh, to introduce it in the 20, uh, 20, uh, uh, 2016 near guidelines on linking and monitoring and evaluation, and also in the guidance note uh, that we did in uh, 17 on uh, on how to address capacity development in programming monitoring and evaluation but apart from this like um, passive uh, promotion personally because i mean i was uh, with uh, enzo and other colleagues behind this methodology i i never did that so i was really uh, not very happy with myself and i said okay it has to stop here and so this is thanks also to, uh, pa to Paco's uh, email I mean I realized not really we need to do uh, something then of course Enzo also over the years I mean he asked me but uh, why are not uh, using are not you using this rack I mean it's, and so yes this webinar is uh, is the is the first uh, the first uh, step I mean first to gain awareness and then uh, and then yes I mean uh, we will continue to do that and I really hope that colleagues in the delegations but also also in headquarters I mean for the relevant uh, units I really hope that thanks to that they will actually engage and um, uh, undertake uh, racks either themselves with support of national or maybe if they want to just give it a try and the first one just totally externalize it it can also be but I really hope that this will uh, create the um, the interest and now uh, Paco uh, yeah, no, just just to explain. I mean, uh, in fact, I was very surprised that uh, I thought that this would be widely used in the commission because personally, I thought a fantastic tool, and and uh, and then I was surprised that I didn't see so many about the rack, and uh, as many good things in life that happen by chance. When I met Mari Carmen in Bolivia, she was a consultant. And then I did my four years in Bolivia, four years in Colombia, and I came back in 2019. And by pure chance, I was the head of sector for gender equality in G1. And we had to evaluate the GAP2 program. And my predecessor had decided that this evaluation would be carried out by the engineer. I don't know why. And then it was Mari Carmen who was in charge of that. Ah, Mari Carmen, what are you doing here? So we we, we came in, in contact. and. Uh, and now from my more horizontal position in G1, we have more contact with the engineer and developing the knowledge hub. And so when I saw this, I thought of Mari Carmen and I sent it to her. And in addition, uh, it was like two days ago or three days ago, uh, they, someone sent me a report from the Court of Auditors where the Court of Auditors is criticizing uh, the way the commission is using consultants. And, uh, and whether we make sure that we get what we want when we're doing uh, capacity building and technical assistance, we don't have a method, we don't have. So I thought again, listen, the, the rack would be the thing for this. I mean, the, the court of auditors criticizing us. They don't they don't criticize the way we tender, the way we select value for money, nothing like that. They say, well, but you put technical assistance and you don't know what you get in exchange of your money in terms of capacity building, blah, blah, blah. So um, now 
why it hasn't been used, I think it's like many of the things that we do in the commission and the momentum passes, the people who was pushing from the units were no longer there, I don't know. And then it ended up in a drawer and, uh, and we haven't promoted, so the commission hasn't promoted. What can we do now? I think that something will happen after this report of the Court of Auditors that was only published last week. Uh, and one of the things, and I don't know if this is D4 or, or R6 or who in or R4 would do this without it, who could say, listen, we have this thing we developed, we paid for it, and we have developed this, and, uh, and it's working, and that would be one of the tools to respond to the criticizing of the Court of Auditors. Institutionally, I don't know how can we do it, and I would love to know uh, if the people in Ukraine who tested the rack and uh, they have the same positive opinion as myself, maybe because uh, I mean you cannot judge only by my opinion. But I think there is there is a kind of coincidences now that that would make it useful that someone looks at it and someone at, at at middle management level at least and say, well, we have this, it has worked or not, and uh, it's something that we should put on the table now. Well, this is very interesting. Of course, this is a framework in which uh, the uh, policy framework, uh, uh, the, the opportunity framework uh, is not particularly favorable, although there are uh, different uh, uh, positions uh, that uh, some of, of those can help the, the process of uh, motivation and participation of the institutions, some not. Uh, in this case, for instance, it's interesting uh, the example of uh, uh, Ukraine, because uh, uh, I explained already the uh, big problems caused by uh, the change of policies uh, uh, of strategies uh, by the government uh, that made a bit obsolete the uh, conception of the program which was based on the approximation to EU uh, institutional framework for rural development. But on the other side, uh, the, uh, the, the, the people that participated in the assessment recognized that they had acquired a lot of competences. So the capacity outputs were there, uh, for instance, uh, the establishment of uh, um, uh, an animal health uh, service, uh, the establishment of standards uh, for uh, um, a, um, for the, the for food safety. Uh, so these uh, these were very very important, but these were just capacity outputs in the sense that were new competences but didn't translate themselves in a, a new system uh, because the institutions didn't have autonomy, uh, the, uh, the, the control and certification institutes uh, were not used and the uh, actual implementation of uh, legal implementation of the framework was not in place because no one, no ministry, no directorates had the uh, initiative and the capacity to put these uh, uh, issues in practice because the government, for the government, this was not a priority. So there were a number of other priorities. Uh, uh, individuals were pushed so towards uh, uh, individual solution to their career and not uh, through the strengthening of the institutions and so on and so forth. So uh, we may have uh, some uh, good outputs from a project, even if uh, the external framework is not conducive. But we should understand that if the external framework is not conducive, it's very difficult to have a significant uh, outcomes in terms of capacity development.
Yeah, I will uh, maybe provide an answer, and then of course back when uh, and so you can jump in with your um, your opinions. Uh, from I mean, from my perspective, uh, you need I mean the typology of um, of uh, of experts that you will need. Uh, I mean, they will be more like facilitators because the experts are just there to facilitate the uh, the self self assessment uh, by the key stakeholders. So they are not there. To, uh, to evaluate or to interact like in a normal or standard evaluation if you want. So they are more uh, facilitators of the whole process. Then of course, they are the ones that will be uh, then putting everything together. So they will also need to have for sure, I mean, like the key notions in mind, so what are the output, the outcomes? So I mean, a minimum of expertise in, um, in uh, theory of change for sure is needed, but I will further insist more on the facilitating um, uh, profile more than any, for sure, any, I mean, you don't need sectoral experience. Experts, uh, just uh, to be honest, I mean, you don't need them. It's just really someone that it actually that actually facilitates the the whole uh, the whole process, because then also in terms of um, developing the the final note, as you will see in the example of Bolivia, it's a really um, a rather a simple note. So um, no, th this will be my uh, my take and my recommendation. I don't know if uh, Enzo and Paco agree or disagree. I I do agree. Uh, I mean the 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 idea of the methodology, it was that after one or two exercises, the delegation could do it itself without consultants. Of course, our problem always is that we don't have the time to do it. But, mm -hmm. but once you read the methodology and you have it with you, it doesn't seem to me too, too difficult to, to implement it. And then another thing, I mean, we're always thinking of, my example was, <coughs> excuse me, a very complicated capacity building program with many stakeholders, but but I was thinking in, in all countries, we have a, a civil society plan. And when there is a capacity development of civil society, one of the uses for this is when we try to build capacity in grassroots and grassroots organizations of civil society, very small NGOs that, uh, and that they unite in a consortium of, of of local NGOs or whatever, and, and we need to provide capacity building, this methodology could help them to assess all this. I mean, are you in a position to discuss with the government? Are you in a position to attract people and, and come up with a plan to make it more scientific the way you, you give them technical assistance? And this, in theory, I mean, the person who is dealing with civil society in the delegation would be able to lead this exercise and have three local consultants and, and who would do the logistics and, and put the papers together and, and replace the time that this local agent or contract agent normally doesn't have because he has a million things to do. And so do you? Uh, well, uh, I think that, uh, um, yes, we, we, we can, uh, um, Let's say that a certain experience in evaluation is not uh, is not bad, uh, because I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't uh, suggest that uh, you need just a facilitator, because as facilitator uh, you can uh, imagine that uh, that the ideal uh, expert to carry out this exercise uh, is. Uh, is really just a group facilitator. This is not the case. Uh, but on the other side, I absolutely share the idea of uh, Francisco, of Paco, that uh, um, the, the aim is to enable the delegations to do this work themselves. Uh, of course, they don't have the time, so uh, they can um, entrust uh, uh, a local expert to support them, to organize the meeting, to animate the meeting, uh, uh, to provide uh, inputs, uh, etc. But they should do uh, the work themselves because they are the, <clears throat> the, the, the persons in a constant contact, direct contact with uh, the stakeholders. And so they are the most able uh, persons and institutions uh, to do this assessment. Uh, I think that uh, uh, this is a, 
really we should aim at that, but we, we should uh, establish a sort of trajectory to arrive to this, uh, mm -hmm. to this objective. Uh, we should start with the training of several experts. Uh, we should uh, ask the delegation uh, which are the ones that would like to undertake on a given pro program uh, this exercise. And uh, we have prepared on the other side the some key experts. We send them with the experts and we start building an experience at the local level. Then uh, we can provide a support to the delegations that want to undertake uh, this. Uh, so, so we should build a sort of task force uh, by training them uh, on, the, on, the, on the method and then uh, support the delegation through this task force for the implementation of the method. And I think in that way, uh, this may be rather widespread. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, we can uh, discuss, uh, yes, internally between uh, IMPA, D4, and NIR, uh, A4, just on how to, uh, to further work on this and how to, how to further promote. Yeah, I mean, we can, we can totally do that. I don't think that you will, uh, we will actually need much, uh, much funding, plus anyway, we have different contacts, so I don't think that this will be even, uh, even an issue, but, uh, but yes, yeah, certainly we can engage into this uh, discussion, yeah. No, indeed. I mean, we really need to promote this uh, and uh, to make the rack uh, uh, like a reality and not just uh, like some sporadic examples uh, here and there. Yeah, and local authorities. Uh, yeah, there are uh, different uh, uh, partners indeed. Maybe you will be surprised. Maybe I recommend you to do a rack. Maybe uh, I understand that you work in uh, in enlargement, but maybe you will be surprised by the result. And as I was saying before, I mean, one of the things that actually uh, was uh, mostly um, uh, valued by uh, people in uh, Bolivia was actually the, uh, the awareness of their own learning path, individual and organizational, but also individual uh, parts. So it's for me, of course, I mean, the, the, the opportunity framework in Bolivia was maybe a very positive one, one that was actually able to further nourish in all this uh, development. But still, I believe that uh, in other contexts, context maybe with a bit less of a positive opportunity framework, the RAC can actually be a very valuable uh, tool huh? because of that, because it makes you uh, be aware of, uh, of capacity that you haven't envisaged or uh, foreseen before. And uh, I think this is pretty uh, valuable. And so you can uh, maybe... Okay, thank you. I think that uh, the, the example of Bolivia and the example of Ukraine are two absolutely opposite examples in terms of opportunity framework. And there are uh, large range of other examples that are in the middle. So the, the Iraq doesn't, uh, it was not the instrument to uh, build the capacity to develop, but it was a diagnosis in instrument that provided uh, some priorities to improve the capacity development process. And uh, the same uh, in Ukraine, if you want, because uh, the, the, the Iraq uh, highlighted the fact that uh, the only possibility of this project that was turning to an end was uh, the continuous training, uh, waiting that uh, a new opportunity framework uh, would be established and uh, this training could be useful and used in, uh, in some way. So in any case, the Dirac is a, a pragmatic tool to assess the situation and highlight which are the main bottlenecks 
and uh, what could be done uh, in order to improve capacity building. Yeah, and in, on my side, of, I mean, first, first on whether the, the EU was supporting something illegal, of course, that was not the case. We were not that crazy in, in Bolivia. What he, what they tried mm -hmm. is to change the convention from inside. Uh, didn't get the, the enough support in the voting, so he stepped out of the convention. The Bolivia stepped out for for a year. That was a big scandal, and everybody was against Bolivia. And they came in uh, with an exception for Bolivia for traditional uses of, of coca leaves. And there was a famous, um, a famous episode of Evo Morales in, in Vienna in, 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 the, in the meeting of the UN Convention of Drugs, where he started to speak and took a, a branch of, of a coca bush. And then he was handing the the branch and so on. And this is our secret uh, leave, blah, blah, blah. And I need 100 kilos of this to, to create one kilo of coca. Or, and um, you would have arrested me in the airport because according to you, this is illegal. So he was all the indigenous thing. But what he did was legal. He was a step out of the convention and then came in with, with, uh, with an exception for traditional uses that had to be voted. And if more than I don't remember if it was 15 or 20 countries would have opposed, they could not have we come to the convention. The United States opposed, uh, the European Union is not opposed, but we had a lot of pressure from the Americans to oppose. And there were another two or three countries that opposed, but not enough not for uh, Bolivia to come in. But in any case, what you say is true. I mean, they were all motivated. It was it was the indigenous policy to show the world that uh, uh, another policy was was possible and that it was effective reducing uh, production. And indeed, for the for the four years that that I was there, they reduced the coca surface year after year until they reached twenty two thousand. I think after that, then they increased again. But, but the rack, what was useful to me was not to show the success of a capacity building program, but you could use the rush, the, the rack to, to assess something that is not working and, and to try to guess why it's not working. Uh, so in the same way that, that we identify some weaknesses that we were able to improve. Uh, and of course, in that particular case, we were able to identify a lot of successes. But the rack is, is simply to have an objective method to assess it. Whether this is good or bad is a, is a different question. So if you have a capacity building program that is not working, I think the rack would be useful to, to let you know in a more scientific way why it's not working and, and where do you need to, to, to work on or to attack to make it work if that was possible. Sometimes, as you said, it's simply not possible. And, uh, and the value in Kelly world is nothing to do here. Yeah, yeah. And they, they, after I left, they continue increasing. The European Union is now doing budget support not only for the alternative development, which was the okay. reduction of the offer. But for the for the part on enforcement of the cocaine fields and uh, the cocaine lab okay. and everything, so we support the police and the and the military on their enforcement of, of drugs. And the Minister of Health also continues being the, the center of gravity of the whole policy. And and this is, you know, that Evo Morales uh, lost the elections and and then uh, there was. The opposition came to power, and after after one year, there were elections, and Evo Morales' party won again. If there had been a change of regime, and uh, let's say a conservative party, probably all this will disappear again. Eh? We don't know, and you always it's the risk. That, yeah. you know, you bet for a policy, and if the policy is not the policy of the opposition and they win, then what's going to happen. But it's true that haven't demonstrated their successes. And as I said, Bolivia had 40,000 in the maximum, out of which 20,000 were legal or legal uses. So had 20,000 of leaves that were going to black trafficking effectively. 
Colombia had 200,000, Peru had 60,000. Bolivia was the smallest of the program. However, the Americans were every year certifying that Colombia was doing well and that Bolivia was, oh, yeah. was so, so lowly credible what the Americans were saying that nobody really took them seriously on, on that. Okay, so maybe with this, we, we close the uh, the webinar. Uh, thank you for being there. And also thank you very much, um, Enzo, for your participation uh, today. And uh, well, we we will see now, we will do a follow-up uh, on this uh, on these two webinars that we uh, that we did. And maybe after the after the summer, we, yes, we, we will need to sit, I think also with our relevant colleagues in, uh, in IMPA to see how we can further promote um, yeah this tool, maybe this awareness was useful, but uh, I mean, we didn't uh, reach uh, uh, all the um, interested stakeholders. So yes, we, we will need to think about that. And, but anyway, for the time being, thank you. Thank you very much for being there. And uh, again, and so for uh, thank you. the presentation. Thank you to all.